Today is May 21st, 1996. Our survivor is Margie Berger. Her maiden name was Vague. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America. Our language is English. Today is May 21st, 1996. Our survivor's name is Margie Berger. Her maiden name was Vague. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Hi. Could you please tell us your name with the spelling? My name is Margie Berger. The spelling is M-A-R-G-I-E. Berger is B-E-R-G-E-R. -E what was your name at birth? At birth, it was uh, Godalovich. Vague Isaacovich. Those names came. My in Europe, the parents went after their mother's names. So my mother went Gadalovich. My father was Isaacovich after his mother. And when I came to this country, I was named Vague. How did that because happen? my aunt didn't know what name to name me, whether Gadalovich or Isaacovich. So she went and she named me Wake because my grandfather's name was actually Wake. And she named me Wake. And uh, I was too weak to talk and to, to, to understand what was going on. So she named me Wake according to her name. Could you tell me your Hebrew name? My name is Mati, M-A-T-Y. Were you ever known by any other names or nicknames? No. What's your birth date? 6 12 27, 1927. What's the month? June 12th, 1927. How old are you now? I am 68 years old. Could you tell us where you were born with the spelling? I was born in Nizhny Apsha. N I S H N I. Apsha is A P S H A, I believe. In which country? That's in Czechoslovakia. Could you tell us about the town where you were born? The town was born was a small town. Everybody knew each other. It was about uh, 200 Talaisim. Uh, what does that mean? That means it's about 200 Jews lived in the town. Uh, when I grew up, it was under very, very good till 1939. In 1939, life has changed for me, for my family, for all the Jews. What did the town actually look like? Uh, town was, it was a school. There was a post office, there was a shul, two shuls. Nothing extraordinary, it was a small town. How many non-Jews lived in the area? That I don't know. I don't know how many non-Jews. But uh, it was a fairly small town. Everybody knew each other by their first name, where they lived, they didn't need no address. They didn't need no uh, nothing. Just this and this house, people lived. And uh, it was very simple, a very simple life. Was very this nice life. It was a happy life. Was this town near a larger city? Yes, it was. It was near Aknas Latina, which it was a larger city. Then it was near Marmara Siget, about 12 kilometers, uh, 10 kilometers to uh, Oknas Latina, and uh, 12 kilometers to Marmara Siget. Marmara Siget was a big city. There they had movie houses, and they had clubs, and they had different things already. It was a different, a much bigger, a much bigger city than ours. Do you remember your house? Yes, I do. What did it look like? It was a beautiful big house. Um, we weren't considered poor people. We had a nice business, <clears throat> my parents. Um, they made nice money. 
But still enough, I had an uncle in the United States, my mother's brother, two brothers actually. And uh, they had sent a lot of money and we built a beautiful big house. Uh, it was bigger than most of the houses in, in Apsha. And um, it wasn't quite ready, everything yet, because the war had broken out and money had stopped coming. And, uh, but it was a tremendous big house for the, for the community. If they, anybody wanted to make parties or if the circus came into town or anything was what was going on in town, it was done in our house. If they had a ball, so the rooms were there, tremendous big large rooms, and uh, and they made everything in that in that house. Did the house have an exact address? Not as far as I could remember. It was the center. The as you came in from 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 any other city, from any other town, to Apsha, it was the first house probably, and the main street. And right across the street was a school, and right across the street my grandfather lived. What was his name? My grandfather's name was Milo Veik, and he was a very prominent uh, uh, person. Um, it's hard to talk. Um, he was when the rabbis, the rabbis came from different towns. They came to us. They came to my grandfather's house and they stayed in my grandfather's house. And uh, he was known to everybody. Everybody knew who my love egg was. He was a charitable person. He helped for people. It came before Pesach. In Europe, they didn't have no vegetables a whole winter because you couldn't go out to the supermarket and just buy it. So he prepared from the summertime in the, <clears throat> in the cellar. And he had before Passover, he gave out a lot of apples for, for um, poor Jews that they didn't have and gave out raisins, I mean nuts, for the horses. What do you remember about the Jewish community in your area? What I remember in my area about Jewish community, it was a religious Jewish community. Most people were very orthodox. Uh, I was too young, I remember that my parents went to shul, I went with them. That only happened in the summertime. In the wintertime it was too cold and there was no heat in the shuls, so they didn't go to shul. What businesses were there in your area? We had, we sold liquors. Uh, there were groceries, my aunt, three houses away from us. She had a big grocery store that she was selling groceries. There, was, uh, peop there were people with candy stores. Candy stores, that meant it's candy stores, really. Uh, they were selling candies, they were selling chocolates, they were selling cookies on a small scales, not like here, but um, uh, there were people, shoemakers, they were, uh, what other stores do I remember? Dressmakers, but a lot of them. That's all about as far as I could remember. Could you tell us about your mother and her name? Her name was Devora Alta. Devora Alta. Huh? Alta, she was named because she was very sick when she was younger, so they named her a second name. Um, she was 
She was a very, very, very smart woman. She was intelligent. She was extremely smart. People from the town, if they needed an advice or anything, they used to come to my mother for advice. She was very much in business. She was a businesswoman. She always used to tell us, wherever you go, she was a wonderful housekeeper, a wonderful um, housewife, baking and cooking and keeping the house in excellent condition. And when she used to go to different towns, she used to ask, how do you, if she ate something, a cookie or a piece of cake, how do you make this? How do you, what kind of recipes do you use in this? She, then she came home and she told the children, she says, if you want to know anything, you should always ask. This is what makes you wise because nobody is smart enough and nobody knows enough. And but when you're asking questions, then you're learning a lot from people. And she always used to come home with different recipes, with different um, uh, things to make. Or she was self-educated in Europe. People didn't go to colleges or to what. But whatever she knew, she spoke a perfect Hungarian because that time when she was born, it was Hungary. And uh, she spoke Hungarian, she spoke Yiddish. And uh, she raised a beautiful family before, before the war, before anything. We were five sisters. And uh, she, was, she was just a wonderful, wonderful person, a wonderful mother, a wonderful, a wonderful um, wife, I mean a, uh, a wife and very smart and very, very up to date, very up to date with everything. Could you tell us about your father? My father, I remember when I was only till 10 years old, whatever I remember of him, he was charitable, he was a hardworking man, he worked together with my mother in the business, he was orthodox. When I was 10 years old, he left for South America. And uh, why did he go? He went to South America because there started trouble already. He left in 1938. Started trouble, we heard from the Polish Jews that Polish Jews went through, they started yet in 1933 or when, trouble in Poland, and it was no good for Jews. So my mother had cousins in South America and Colombia, and those cousins were able to take out only one person from a family. And he left, my mother said, you better go because when you'll be there, you'll be able to take out the family, your wife, and your children. So he left in 1938 to South America. And as soon as he arrived there, he started working on papers to send us out the papers. In 1939, the Hungarians came in to our hometown. The Hungarians came in, the papers arrived when the Hungarians came in. And we started out leaving for South America, my mother and my, f my five children. We came as far as Budapest and they didn't let us, they didn't let us go through. The, the borders were closed for Jews and we couldn't go any place. So my mother turned back. She came back with five small children. Then they took us away from our house. Let's go back a little bit. Um, could you tell me about your sisters? I had a sister, Ella. She was a year and a half younger. 
she could have survived, but she was a very small, skinny child. She had a problem with eating at home. They, we went to school. Then I had a sister, Basco. She was a gorgeous child with round, beautiful brown eyes, with curly hair like Shirley Temples. And, um, and Basco was, um, uh, Ella was 14 when she went to concentration camp. Anyway, we were moved about two years apart. So who was the first child? The first I was. The second was Ella. The third was Basco. And then I had two twin sisters, Henchi and Laichu. They were gorgeous two twins. One was a blonde and one was a uh, brunette. They were just gorgeous children. You mentioned a grandfather. Do you remember any other grandparents? No. This is the only grandfather I know. And he was a lot, a lot of times in our house. He loved to talk to my mother. He loved to discuss things with, with, with her. Uh, he was just wonderful, and we lived just across the street from him, so I was always there. And I had a lot of aunts in that house, and that house was a very happy house because it was bigger girls and boys used to come to the house. And uh, it was just in, like in a small town, was self-entertaining. On Shabbos afternoon, they used to get together and they used to sing. They used to. Do you remember any of the songs that people would sing then? The old songs, I. <laughs> it was a Romanian songs. My children know it. <laughs> My children know it. Haya casa puya shore, kezmi kutsa kezmi ora. Samplicat, samplicat, Sara, Hayaka, Sapuyasho. Not a, not a singer. <laughs> it's funny, my voice is terrible. <laughs> How did you spend time as a family? That was before, before the war. Well, you we went to school. Do you remember the school you went to? The school didn't have no name. As I said, there was a town that uh, nothing had, everybody knew where to go, but uh, nobody knew no addresses. There was no addresses. Um, we went to school. We played outside. What after kind school. of games did you play? What kind of games? I, my children always, I always told them, I says, I'll never be too old to buy myself a doll, because I always wanted a doll and I never had one. <laughs> so we used to take a piece of wood, wood that they used to throw in into the into the um, to make fires in Europe, in those uh, wood stoves or whatever they called it. They made uh, so I used to take a piece of wood and put on a kerchief on the wood and take, take a piece of chalk or a piece of coal and, and make a nose and make eyes. And that was my doll. And this is the way we played. And my uncle used to come from the United States and used to bring me uh, uh, a carriage, a doll carriage, or things like this. But we always managed to play, and we always found something to do. What was your uncle's name? My uncle's name was Alex, um, Alex Gold. He shortened his name from Gadalowicz to Gold. So, uh, and he was just wonderful to me and to my family. I came out to this country and uh, he was, he, he took me out to, this con to the United States. And he was very good. He lived in Williamsburg in a small apartment. 
and I came out with an end of mine, Penny Hainish. Her name was at home, Feige, Feige Wake. Here, she, her married name was Penny Hainish. We were together with her all the time. Could you tell us about school? What sort of subjects did you take in school? Math, reading. Uh, I was a small child then. Yet. How long did you go to school? For how many years? I just went to school till the Hungarians came in, in 1939. That was, how old was I? 12 years old. Then they stopped the Jews from going to school. Was your family Orthodox? Yes. How was Shabbos in your home? It was a regular Shabbos. My father wore a stramo. My mother wore a shaitl. And a shaitl she wore that she didn't have her own hair whatsoever. She was cut off completely. They put on a, a hairpiece. Uh, I don't know what they call it. That, that's how orthodox. And we weren't allowed to get up from the table without benching. It was, she taught us the right way. She brought us up the right way. She, we went to, I went to public school. And after public school, there was no uh, yeshivas like it's here today. We went to Haider. We went, my mother brought in a teacher for us, and that teacher taught us Hebrew. What else did you learn from this teacher? He came in and he taught us Hebrew after school. And he taught us all the denim and he taught us all the, the brujos. And he's, he was just wonderful. My mother believed she was a great believer in education, a great believer. What special foods did you have for Shabbos? It was soup, it was meat, meat or chicken, and then kugels, Friday night. Shabbos was always chont. What was and the chont? And the chont was made of, they made it themselves. They put it in, I'll never forget it. I used to bring over the, uh, the, the pot of the chont to my grandfather's house. My grandfather's house, most of the neighbors, most of the community brought over it. They had a big oven, and they used to put it in. As I remember it now, they used to put in the pots, those, um, um, how do you call those pots? Something like that, what do you call it? Anyway, uh, into the oven. And they put in, and the way it came out, this is the way we ate it. If it came out soupy, it was soupy chong. It came out, it came out a, a, a heavy one. It burned a little bit, so we ate that. But it was wonderful. My aunt, I'll never forget, she used to be the one who put in the chong into the oven. And then they used to take horse shit and to put it all around it, because that sealed it. With, with, and, 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 and they closed up the oven. It was, you know, like a, a little window. They closed up the oven. They used this on the outside of the oven to seal it? Yes, that it should keep the, the hot oven. It should cook the chant. That was on Friday afternoon. And then it was... Uh, they sealed it, and this is the way uh, most of the most of the time came in to my grandfather to bring in the chont to be cooked. What was Pesach like? I'm trying to remember how it was on Pesach. I don't rem I don't remember too much. It was a wonderful holiday. I know it was, everybody had to have new clothes, something new, a new dress, new shoes. 
and I was always dressed very well because I was born 10 years after my parents were married. So when I was born, Mashir was born. So whatever I wanted, I had it. I always had everything because they were able to afford. And then they, they, uh, I was born a firstborn after so many years. And besides that, I, when I was two years old, I took very sick. I had diphtheria. It was a, um, a epidemic. It was uh, uh, one to a hundred who survived. And I was, and I was taken into Marmarsh to get to the hospital. And my mother was crying and carrying on and going around in the hospital grounds asking, please God help me, help she should survive. And she was asking for Rivka Ruchlaya. She was, this is what my neighbors told me. Who was this? My neighbors in, in Europe, in Apsha. Well, whose name was that? My aunt, oh, the names I don't remember. The name that she used, the Hebrew name she used. Who Rivka, is? you mentioned Rivka. Marty. She, uh, my aunts were always telling me how dear I was and how she was crying and she actually, but her prayers that she brought me back and with God's help that she brought me back that I survived. Do you remember Purim as a young child? Purim as a young child. Pur yes. The, my mother, rest in peace, was baking an awful lot. She was an excellent baker. We were going around um, uh, carrying shalachamonis to different people, and different people came to us. And that was the time I had my mother's a cousin from the next town came, and they put up a play. They used to put up a play. Growing men, they were in their 20s, and they put up a play, and they were playing it in our house, because as I said before, we had a very big house and a very big room in the house. And uh, they, they were always, it was a very uh, fun time fun time. It was a wonderful, before the war, it was a wonderful, lively, nice city. We didn't know of anything else. We were happy with whatever we had. We didn't know there exists um, uh, 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 richness. They, we didn't know there existed uh, beautiful clothes. We thought we, were, we had everything. We had everything, and we were very, very happy. Do you remember what languages were spoken in your home? Only Yiddish. Did Jewish. You, did you have newspapers or radio or telephone? Mm, newspapers, radio, telephone, that I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> We're going to end our tape Maybe, now. maybe newspapers, but not radio, not telephone. No.
This is tape two. Today is May 21st, 1996. Our survivor is Margie Berger. Could you again explain the names that your mother used when you were sick? When I was sick, my mother took me to the to a town, to the hospital. And she was walking around on the grounds of the hospital and she was calling on all the others of Sura Rivka uh, to help her that I should survive after that I was born after 10 years of, of married. What were you doing before the war? I was going to school. As I said before, my father left in 1938. The Hungarians came in in 1939. In 1939, the Hungarians came in. They, I was still going to school twice a week only because Jews weren't allowed to go to, to school anymore. I used to help out my mother in the business. Whenever she had to go away, I was young. But I must have been uh, pretty mature that my mother left me in the business and I helped her out. And we were playing. 1941, it started big trouble in Europe. In 1938, when your father left for South America, what did your family know about what was happening with the rise of the Nazis? We heard from the Polish Jews. How did you get these reports? Uh, through people that they were traveling around. Did you believe them? Yes, we did. I remember I was a child. My mother was going around questioning people, people that they came from different cities. They came from Poland. A lot of Polish people ran away and they came to, to Czechoslovakia because in Czechoslovakia there were no problems yet. They started first in Poland. So this is the way we knew that trouble started. And this is why my, my father went away to, to South America to take us out to save our lives. Did you realize that lives were in danger at that point? Uh, I think so. My mother spoke to an awful lot. I always heard her talk about, to my grandfather about it, to my aunts about, about the situation in, in Europe. And every day it got worse and worse. What was happening? Because in the business I was 12 years old and a um, Hungarian Zaslosh um, um, uh, or whatever they call it. It was a little high-ranking officer. I was very developed. I was big. I probably was as big when I was 12 years old as I am now. And he had made remarks to my mother about me. I had to run away. My mother sent me away to my grandfather's to stay with my grandfather, not to be in the business, not to be near that he should he to, he should notice me, and I stayed there with my grandfather a lots of times till the things passed. Then in nineteen, then then in forty one, they started taking out people. Apparently, they made remarks because um, uh, they weren't Czech citizens. They weren't Czech citizens, if you weren't a Czech citizen, like my aunt was, the uncle that I had here in the United States. She remained in Europe with her children, and she didn't want to leave her parents, and that's how she was left behind, because she didn't want to follow my uncle to the United States. They took her out as an American citizen, and they brought her in 1941. They deported her to Poland and they threw her in, and Poland was a horrible, horrible debt, debt for Jews. They threw them in in, uh, in the seas, in the oceans. While they were alive, the Jews, that's what we heard, and they buried them alive in the, in the big graves, and they took her away in 1941. Right after that, they said to my mother, the Hungarians said that, 
we need your house and you have another house referring to my aunt's house and they asked us to move to my aunt's house. That was in 1941 and we stayed there. My father was gone in 1938. I had to go and help my mother make a living. The living was that she used to go to the Gentiles and buy milk in big containers. So she slept from all over the town, wherever, whoever wanted to sell her the milk. And I slept, and we came home with the milk, with big containers of milk, and she made butter. And she made butter, and she sent, she was traveling to Marmara Sige, to Akna Slatina, to sell the butter. This is the way she made a living for herself and for her five children. Then later on, it got so bad that uh, she had to, she couldn't travel because she had a shaitl on. And it was very dangerous for a Jew with a beard or a Jew with a shaitl to travel in a different city. So she sent me, and I traveled to those towns, to Akna Slatina, to Marmarish Siget, and I was going to sell the butter. Did you travel alone? Alone, yes. How did you travel? With a horse and buggy. The horse and buggy was going every morning. They were going to Akna Slatina. They were going to Marmarish Sigat because it was only 10 kilometers from us. Marmarish Sigat was only 12 kilometers from us. And I used to go as a child. I was 12, 13 years of age. And uh, lots of times, the Hungarian at the border of the Romanian border, because um, uh, Marmar Siget is Romania, they used to stop us, take away everything, whatever we had. I used to come home without butter and without money, without anything. Who would stop you? The Hungarian police. The Hungarian police. And it's, from then on, it started pretty rough for us Jews. And for us, for, for everybody, for everybody. And in, 19, in 1941, then the same year, in 1941, when, my, when they took away my aunt, they wanted to take us away too. Because uh, for no reason at all, whoever the mayor of the city of the, of the town said, that they don't like you or they want to get rid of you. So they got rid of you. It doesn't make a difference. Another person, another Jew was, was, was killed. So they were looking for us. And somebody who said it, I don't remember, I don't know, who suggested to my mother that she should go in hiding for the next day because if they take away the Jews one day, the next day everything will be calmed down because they only rounded up those Jews to take to Poland for a day or so. And once they're taken away those Jews, then she could come out from hiding. So we were in hiding for, for two days. Where did you hide? And we went to Akna Slatina, in my mother's family's place. And we, were, we stayed there overnight and uh, what were your fears at that time? The fears, we were, we, we were frightened. It was a very big fright for us because we heard and we saw what was going on. The Hungarians were worse than the Nazis. The Hungarians, if they caught somebody, they used to beat them up something fearful. I remember a girl from our town. I don't know what she did whether she traveled someplace or what, what she did, I really don't remember. Uh, they used to cut in her hair. She had gorgeous hair. You made like a cross over it. This way to the, to the, from the front to the back and then from one ear to the other. Made like a cross over her hair, hair liner. And they were very, very bad and it was, very, very tough and rough. 
Were any of the non-Jews helpful to you? No. No. We were in hiding. We went away in hiding in 1944 before they took us to concentration camp. We were hidden for six weeks by a Gentile up in the mountains. What was his name? I don't remember. Uh, a Gentile that he, as long as we gave him money, as long as we gave him jewelry, he was keeping us. And then they went out and they were preaching in all the churches that whoever is hiding a Jew, whoever is, 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 is not giving out the Jews is going to be killed, is going to be shot. Whether we didn't have enough money that time or whether we didn't have enough jewelry or whether he was afraid to keep us there, I don't know what reason, but he, one day he came in and he says, you have to leave. That was just before they took us to the ghetto. They rounded up all the Jews in the school. I remember in the school, they rounded up all the Jews. Before the ghetto, do you remember any specific laws that the um, government had passed that affected you personally? Well, they took away businesses. How was that done? Just by taking away. Just they walked in and they took away the businesses. They threw us out of the house. They didn't need no excuses. They didn't need no, no, nothing. Nobody questioned them anything. Were you able to and take? Whatever they were telling us, that's what, we had, that's what we had to obey. Were you able to take anything with you when you were forced out of the house? Yes. We were taking, I remember I was the oldest. My mother brought me in to the house where we lived, in my aunt's house. In the backyard she went in and she, she dug up the ground near the window and she called me in because I have a uh, mark on my neck from my sickness, from the diphtheria that I had. So she was hiding there pearls cultured pearls, five strands of pearls. She says, when you'll be bigger, you should have it, this is for you, to hide the mark on your neck. And she showed me where she was hiding it. And she dug up a, a, a piece of ground in my aunt's house, and she hid their jewelry. She... Uh, What, is, what was the question about? We're talking yeah, about the I mean, laws, the rules, things that affected your life personally. But everything, everything, everything. They, they yeah. actually, they, you couldn't, you couldn't live. You Did you have any curfews? Yes, we had curfews. We had uh, curfews not to go out a certain time. And, uh, uh, in the daytime, we were able to go out. And then it came towards the evening. No Jew was allowed to go out. What about traveling? No traveling, not in 44, no. And what happened with um, getting food supplies? Food supplies we got from our garden, we always had, as I said, we, we, we were growing vegetables in the garden in the summertime, and we put it away for the winter time. And this is the way we had the supplies. And my grandfather had an awful lot of land that they were growing potatoes, they were growing onions, they were growing vegetables, they were growing most everything. And everything was put away from the summertime for the winter time. Was there any problem getting kosher meat? Kosher meat was a was a shaykhet. Was a shaykhet and he was uh, uh, he was shechting. He was slathering the meats, and this is the way we we got meats. Were you always able to get this kosher meat? Yes, 
Yes. Till till the till 1944, I think 1943, 44, uh, we were able to get kosher meats. Were religious services interrupted? Yes. Yes, I think so. I think they were. They must have been. What changed for you with the uh, Hungarians on a on a basis uh, prior to the ghetto, when you were forced into the ghetto? We were get together as in a schoolyard before we went for, to the ghetto. All the Jews knew already to bake because we knew that we are going to labor camps to uh, to to for work. How did you know this? People told us, and this is what I know, what my mother told me, that we are going, they're taking away the Jews, and uh, uh, we should prepare with food. My mother should bake. She baked breads, she baked uh, cakes, she baked cookies, she baked whatever she was able to, this I remember. They sewed in in hands, in hands jewelry, in the shoulder pads, and wherever, wherever they thought of, of a good hiding place, they sewed in the jewelry, just in case we'll run out of money or we wouldn't have no money. We'll buy a piece of jewelry. We'll buy a piece of bread for 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 jewelry. And uh, that's what we that's what we did. And before we went to when we went into the ghetto, my grandfather was so religious that he says, Kinderloch, don't worry, we are going. A Mashiach is coming, and we are going to meet him." My mother wanted to run away from the ghetto with the five children. This I remember because very well. And my grandfather was there to watch her day and night. She told my grandfather that she's planning to run away from the ghetto with the five children. And uh, uh, he was watching her day and night that she shouldn't run away. He says, Mashiach is coming and Mashiach will help us. And if you'll go away, you'll be caught and you'll be shot. Did people escape? From the ghetto, no. From the ghetto, not as far as I know. Nobody escaped. Did you ever have to wear a star? Yes. When was this? From 1939. What did it look like? A yellow, a yellow star we wore on the, on the back of our clothes. Did it have any writing? And in the front of the clothes. Did it have any writing on it? No. How was this attached? Probably pinned down. Did you know any Jews who refused to wear the star? No. They all obeyed, and we all went to the slaughters just like the cows, because nobody put up any resistance. The young men were taken away. Young people uh, in their 20s, in their early 20s. Uh, it was only, rem it remained actually old people and, and, and uh, people with children. How did you feel the first time that you went out publicly with the star? Very embarrassed, very embarrassed and, and very worried because we knew that every day is a new, a new, a new story about Jews, and a new event, and a new problems are coming up, and it was very scary, and it was very worrisome. And uh, I remember my mother, as I see her now, she was scared to death, and she was very worried, and she only said. I don't care about my life, she says, but look at my children's lives. When you finally went to the ghetto, how did you reach it? Uh, we 
went to the ghetto. I guess that everybody went uh, with different... Uh, I really, I don't remember that. Isn't that funny? That completely is out of my mind how we reached, because it was only 10 kilometers from us. So maybe some people walked. I think we walked. I am not sure. Do you remember what you wore? It was in the spring. Must have been around April or May. And in Europe it's still chilly. I guess a jacket and a, and a dress, skirt and blouse. What did you take with you? As I said, a lot of food. A lot of food. Whatever jewelry, whatever money we had, it was sewn in to our clothing. Did you have other clothing with you? Yes, we took a long change of clothing because everybody wore something on their backs. Because I had small, I was the oldest and I had smaller children, smaller sisters. And whatever we were able to carry with us, that's what we took along. What was it like when you first reached the ghetto? When we reached the ghetto, we still had plenty of food because we brought it along with us. We were three weeks in the ghetto, four weeks in the ghetto. For money, you were able still to go out and buy eggs or milk Was from, there a the, fence? from the peasants. Was there a fence around the ghetto? No, not where we stayed. We stayed in mostly in houses, in, let's say, in uh, a few black areas that they made just specially for, for the Jews to get together the Jews in one area. And we were able to walk around between the blocks in the ghetto. Was there a fence around you? No. So no. Did people leave the ghetto to go to other places? No. No. So who you were, we were watched constantly. Who did this watching? The Hungarians. Did you feel any presence of the Germans? No, not yet. The Hungarians were with us all the time. Do you remember what uniforms they wore? Black black suits with tall hats with feathers. The Hungarian police were wearing feathers in their in their hats. Were any of these people neighbors or people that you had known before the war? No. They came in from different towns, from different cities. They brought them in. How did they maintain discipline to keep you from going anywhere? They were watching us. They were watching us. And if they caught somebody doing anything or, or, or not obeying, they used to beat them something terrible something terrible. They took in a lot of rich Jews to demand where their money is, where their jewelry is. Were you aware at any point of the existence of the concentration camps or death camps? Whether I was aware? No. No. We knew that they're taking us for work. That's why we were prepared with food, with whatever money we had and, and, and jewelry. What were your quarters like in the ghetto? We stayed in houses. As I said, a few blocks area, they blocked off for, uh, there weren't too many Jews because they brought in from neighboring, let's say about 200 Jews from uh, Nizhny Apsha. They brought in from uh, from uh, Bahuts, another small little town, another maybe another uh, twenty uh, Jews from there. It wasn't a very large ghetto because there weren't too many Jews in 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 that ghetto. Do you remember anything about the space or the conditions within your apartment there? We, would, we lived a few families in one house. 
we had to share. There were no toilets in the houses. We had to go out to art houses, outside in the backyard. We had to make uh, one kitchen. Everybody tried to get along very nicely, in spite of all the all the all the things. Everybody was just worried where we are going, where they're taking us. What's happening to the Jews? A lot of people were, most of them were very much worried. What sort of religious life did you have within the ghetto? We tried to obtain it just as normal as, as, as at home. Were you able to get news from your father at that point? No. No, we didn't hear nothing from my father. Nothing whatsoever. Did you have any communication with the non-Jews from around the ghetto? Yeah, we bought, we bought eggs from them. We bought the milk from them. Did any of them try to help in any way? No. No. Nobody tried to help because the orders were going out not to help Jews, not to save Jews, not to do anything for Jews. And they scared them, and they were such not intelligent people that they didn't know anything. They took their preacher's word, and they took their, uh, their, uh, the government's word that whoever is going to be caught helping out a Jew is going to be killed. And they were afraid, or they just didn't care, and they didn't want. Do you know any conversations you might have had at that point? You were a young girl. Do you have any friends that you were able to spend time with in the ghetto? Children always remain children. And you know, as much as we worried, but we didn't know really to worry that much. And we didn't know exactly. Tell a child of, of, of 12 years old uh, that this and this, they kill Jews here or there. What does the child know? We was, I, I remember personally, I was very much involved around my mother, and I saw her, her worries, and her, her, it showed on her face, it showed on her emotions, it showed on everything, on everything. She was very much worried, and she, she, she knew what, what was going on, probably. Or she had a sti the stinkling, the stinklings about it. What did you think would happen next? I didn't know. I didn't know what was, what was coming next. Next, I didn't know what was, uh, it was just We're going to stop the tape now. This is tape three. Today is May 21st, 1996, and our survivor is Margie Berger. Do you remember if the ghetto had a Judenrat or any sort of government? I don't remember. Maybe they did, but I don't, I don't know. Do you remember if there were any actions or any deportations while you were there? From the ghetto? No. When did you finally leave the ghetto? 
We left the ghetto. Two or three days before Shrews. Matter of fact, today we have your site. It's 52 years since my mother and my sister and my grandfather, my aunts, all vanished. Um, they took us from the ghetto to cattle cars. They put us in cattle cars. Who gave you these orders? The Hungarians. Were the Germans there at any point now? No. The Germans didn't come in till later. The, the Hungarians put us in, in cattle cars. And the cattle cars were so tightly pushed in between people that we had hardly any room to sit on the floor in the cattle cars. Some people were standing up. It was very, very crowded. The, the circumstances in the cattle cars were terrible. People had to go to, to the bathrooms. People were screaming, children were crying. It was hot. It was congested. It was a horrible, horrible uh, uh, time in the cattle cars. We went for a few a few days, I don't remember exactly how many days it took from, from the ghetto to, till, till we arrived to Auschwitz. Who was with you? With me was my mother, my other four sisters, Ella, Henchi, Basku, Henchi, Elaychu. My grandfather, Melech, uh, uh, Mayer, no. Myloch, Myloch, and my aunts, Feige, uh, Haichu, and Zeldi, and her daughter, and my aunt, Sarah, with her children, with her five children. What was Sarah's last name? Gadalovich. She came along. Um, from the family, that's all what I know from the family that came along. Then it was other Jews from our hometown, from Nizhny Yapsha were Jews. They were Jews probably from Akna Slatina, the Jews, from uh, Bahuts, Next town from us, a small, very small town. They came along with us. What did you have with you? Only packages of food and a little bit of clothing, probably to change off the, the season, the winter season with the summer season. Very, I think, little, little clothes. Most of it was food. Do you remember what you were wearing? A dress, a dress, uh, um, the Jewish stars, we was on our backs, uh, very simple. Where very did you think you were going? To work. Any specific place? No. What did you no, think you'd be doing? No, no, but I remember in the cattle cars were small little windows not um, very small with, with, uh, with wiring on them. So somebody, whether he knew where we were going, he says, Kinderloch, children, we are not going to work. They're taking us someplace else, but not to work. What did you think at that point? Not much. We couldn't do anything, and we couldn't think of anything. And we were just in God's hand. We were all religious. We believed in God, and God should only help us. That's all what we were thinking of. We, weren't, uh, we didn't have no choice. Wherever they were going to take us, we were in their mercy and their, in, their, in their hands. How long was the trip? 
Oh, that I don't remember. It was it was a few days. It was a few days, three, four days. I really don't remember exactly how long it took. What was the first thing you remember when the doors of the cattle car were opened when you reached Auschwitz? We stepped down from the cattle cars. There were Nazis with dogs. Uh, there were other people with striped clothing. That was the Polish Jews that they were there from before us. They took us down from the cattle cars. They saw me. I, that I'll never forget. A guy came over to me and he saw that I'm young. He says, if they ask you, how old? How old are you? Tell them you are 18 years old. That's what I knew to tell them. If they saw women, young women, young mothers, with small children, and they knew where we were going. They knew that we were not going to work anymore. They tried to take away the, the children from the mothers and give them to old people to save the young people, the young mothers, that they shouldn't go to the gas chambers. Uh, it was so fast. The Nazis kept on yelling, faster, 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 faster to get off from the cattle cars, faster to move with the, with the, with the people. Fast, fast, fast. Everything was very fast. And I was holding on to my mother. My other sisters were holding on to my mother. And we came in front of the Nazis whether it was Mengele at that time, I didn't know yet whether it was Mengele, a Nazi was there. And he asked me, we out this too? So I told him I'm 18 years old. So he pushed me to the right, pushed my mother and my sisters to the left. My mother started crying. She started screaming. It's my daughter. Let her come with me. Where are you taking her? I didn't know. I was so confused. They shoved me to the other side. I was on the other side didn't get a chance to say goodbye, didn't get a chance to kiss my mother, didn't get a chance to do nothing. I was just pushed away suddenly. And it was very dramatic for me. It was very... Then we came to a place, it was like a barn. It must have been one of those uh, uh, lagers. And they were also Polish Jews, and the Nazis were staying over them. And they shaved us from head to toe. And, and they gave us clothes, striped clothes. Did you have a shower? They took us to the shower. They gave us clothes. And they, we, they marched us to the, to, the, to the camps. Where did you think your mother went? I didn't know nothing what was going on until I didn't come to the, to the camp. It was called Seelager because in Auschwitz they had A, C, B, C, D lagers, different lagers for, uh, for men separate uh, uh, lagers, for women separate lagers, for gypsy separate lagers, for everybody they had different lagers. We arrived to it, called, it was called Seelager. 
say like it, they put us into a block eight. It was me and my two aunts, Feige and Haichu. Their last names? Vague. Could you spell that for us? V-E-G-H. And we arrived in that, in that uh, 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 lager, and I was crying hysterical. I want my mother. I want my mother. And the block eldest, the block eldest was a, 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 a Polish Jewish girl who she was in concentration camp since 1939, 1940. She had already hair growing. She was very, she was very strict and very mean. But now I could understand why, because the lager made you that way. So, and I was crying and I was carrying on and she said, she took me outside and she says, did you see, do you see those chimneys? Those chimneys were with smoke. She says, they're not baking bread for you over there. They're baking your, your parents and your sisters and your brothers. When I heard that, I was just hysterical. I was just hysterical. I didn't know what happened. At that time when she told me what happened, I knew what happened. As much as we didn't have what to eat, I didn't even want to eat whatever I had, whatever they gave me, because I was devastated. I was separated from my mother without any warning without any words, without anything. Just pushed aside to the left and to the right, and, that's, and that, was, that was the whole situation. <coughs> and I was together with my Aunt Feige. In Seilager, in Block 8. What was it like? It was hell. We slept on bunkers. On bunkers it was like level one, level two, and level three. I think we were on level three on the, on the, on the upper bunker. I was always close to my end because I didn't have anybody. I clung to her like, like a child clungs to a mother. She was a few years, a nice few years older than I am. I am not going to mention the, the age because just in case she'll hear the tape. Uh, she was with state sail appell. Sail appell meant five o'clock in the morning. They used to wake us up, and five people in a row stayed. Five, 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 five. You know, till we were all of them, all of us. I stayed with Feige and three other girls from my hometown. It was Malka, it was Sura, Less and names. it was Mari Lebovich. We were staying in that in that sail appell, all of us, I mean the five of us, every morning and every night. At night and in the morning we were standing sail appell. How long did it this last? It could have been rain, snow, sleet, storm, anything. We were out there with our little, little clothes, no jacket, no sweater, no nothing. How we survived I can't believe it even today. I'm starting to think, and I say, no, we couldn't have gone through what we went through and be alive. What was your clothing like? Just a little, uh, a little dress or a skirt and a jacket. That's all what I remember. What sort not, of jacket? Not a jacket, not a warm jacket. I mean, a two-piece outfit. What did you wear on your feet? Uh, I think wooden wooden uh, shoes. Did you have underwear? Wooden shoes that they gave us. 
I think wooden shoes, but I'm not so sure. Something very light, no stockings, no, no, no nothing. Do you have underwear? No. No. No bras, no underwear, no nothing. When you originally came to Auschwitz, were you numbered or tattooed? Some people were numbered. I wasn't numbered. The reason why, I don't know. Some, the block elders, they used to tell us because we weren't supposed to survive. Uh, we weren't tattooed. I wasn't tattooed. My aunt, Faggy, wasn't tattooed neither. And that block, and block eight, I don't remember anybody should have a tattoo. How many people were in this block? I know we slept like herrings, one close to the other. In one way it was good because we kept warm, because there was only nothing underneath, nothing underneath and nothing above us to cover ourselves. Just plain under, under, under boards we slept. We were very congested. How many it was in that block, I don't know. I really don't know how many it was in the... It was a very long camp, I mean, uh, uh, lager. And in the center, it had a like a, like a dividing um, a thing. The divider was about this, this wide because it was beds on this side and beds on, on, on the left and the right side, on both sides, all along the whole block. What was the purpose of this divider? I have no idea for what, because I think, but I think, I'm not sure, when they made, sometimes they made the, uh, selections, the Nazis used to come in. So maybe they pushed over on one side all the people and the ones who they wanted to, to survive or to go to the crematorium. I don't know. The reason I don't know why. But it was a big divider in, 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 uh, in each block, in each, in each uh, thing. And uh, we're staying in Pell in the cold, in the freezing cold. It was very cold. We stayed in, 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 in Auschwitz. From, from May till October. What was a typical day like for you in the camp after the morning tselapel? After the morning tselapel, the tselapel, they brought out the bread, a piece of bread this long it was, and it was cut in five pieces, this much bread. It was cut in, sm in five pieces. And everybody got a piece. You know, the center, whoever was in the front of the of the of the of the, the line, room. got the order of bread, and she gave everybody a piece in the back. We got a piece of bread. We didn't know we were so hungry. We didn't know we could have eaten up the whole thing, the whole piece of bread. Then they came with some kind of a black coffee or some kind of a soup that it was sheer water. Some of them got that little bit of, of, of soup or water or what, I don't know what to call it. Some of them didn't get it. We were pushing for it. We were staying in line and pushing for it to get a little bit of, of warm water. We saved that piece of bread for a whole day, for a whole night and we were guiding that piece of bread like somebody is guiding, I don't know what to tell you, diamonds, gold, silver, uh, 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 their life. Let's put it this way. And this is the way we were guiding that, that piece of bread because there were a lot of people who stole from us. They were hungry, not because they were mean or they wanted to steal. They were hungry. So we watched that piece of bread and we always gave a, a, a bite from that piece of bread just then we felt already, you know, that we are fainting from hunger. Was there enough water for drinking? No. 
no drinking water. They had in the back of the of the of the camp, back of the uh, lager, a fountain with water that sometimes we were able to get to washed off a little bit. We had full of lice on us. We were dirty. We were just a little fresh water to freshen us up a little bit so it would feel a little bit better. Sometimes you got a chance to do that and most of the time you didn't get a chance to do it. The situation became so bad that they came and they took us on march. Twice we were escorted to the up to the to the crematorium. I was in that march, my aunt was there, and of course thousands of other uh, Jewish uh, women. Then we came to the crematorium twice. God was with us, and my mother, my mother was, was up there and praying for us that we shouldn't be destroyed. So we were staying there near the crematorium for a few hours. And then they turned us back to the camp. Why? I don't know. Whether they got orders or whether other transports came in from different towns, from different countries, and they were overloaded. I don't know. I really don't know why. You couldn't be smart. You couldn't be educated. You couldn't be... Uh, 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 pretty, you couldn't be nothing. Only sheer luck made you survive. That's all. And uh, uh, so we were turned back twice from near the crematorium. We stayed very close with my aunt all the time. Then it came in the beginning when we arrived, we arrived in May. And they announced they want 80 beautiful girls to register themselves. What did you think this meant? Some people, they said, don't register yourself. Wherever they don't call you, wherever they call you, don't go. Because we didn't know where we were going, but, but the circumstances were so badly there. The, the, the hunger and the, and, the, and the dirt was so terrible, and the, and the beatings and, and everything else, that we took a chance. So it was me, my aunt Haichu, and my aunt Feige. Of course, other people too, but I mean, people that I know, we went and we registered. We wanted to be on that transport to go out from Auschwitz. They didn't pick nobody, they only picked my aunt Haichu. They didn't pick me, they didn't pick Taigi. They took her out from us, so we were left only the two of us in Auschwitz. They took her out to a different, to Germany, and she had it pretty good. She was working for a for a uh, for a, a Nazi officer, cleaning their houses. Their, uh, their she was cleaning the houses. She was polishing their boots. She was doing chores in the house, and whatever food it was left over from them, they told her you could eat it. Was she ever mistreated by them? No, no. She, whatever she told me, whatever I know, she had it much better than we did have it. What sort of conversations would you have when you were alone with your aunt or with friends? We were talking about the old times in Europe. We were talking about our childhood. Do you remember Pesach, and do you remember Purim, and do you remember Shabbos, and do you remember this, and you remember that? 
we always carried on and talked and what is going to be with us. Who knows whether we'll survive. And we always used to say to one another, whoever is going to survive should be able to tell the world what we went through because we never knew from the bunk that we were laying and from the landslide that we were together. Whoever is going to survive should be able to tell the world what a holocaust and what a horrible experience and what a horrible life we went through and what the Nazis and what the Hungarians did to us. So we made ourselves happy by talking about good times and when it was good for us. Do you remember observing any Jewish rituals while you were in Auschwitz? No. Do you remember anybody else being able to do that? Not as far as I know. Not as far, no. People might have remembered that it was coming up, it was, uh, uh, it was Pesach, it was Shrews, now it's Shrews, now it's Pesach, now it's the high, high holidays. Maybe they remember they were older people. I mean, not old, there wasn't old people there. In their 30s, in their early 40s. Who was actually youngest that you remember? The youngest who survived was a 13-year-old. I was 16 years old. And what about the oldest? The oldest couldn't have been more than in the, in the, in the 40s. Did you have to work in Auschwitz? No. How did you spend your day? By just sitting and talking and being on the, on the, this here and being on the lookout. There used to always come in Nazis and looking around and taking orders from the block Just don't open the door, don't go out, don't come in. We were like closed in in the, in the, in the, in the camp, in the, in the block. That's what I remember. The only time we went out, it was during sail appeal. That was in the morning and at night. Were you ever in a position to be of help to anyone? No. But I had. I had people who helped me. How? My aunt, Feige, if, without her, I honestly don't know whether I would have survived. That's why I am so close to her today. She is my aunt, she's my mother, she's my sister. Because that's all I had. And once they came and they made a selection, and they took her away from me. And when I saw that, I started screaming and crying. And I was screaming so loud, and she said, Mati, jump over, that means that divider. And I gave a jump over because I didn't have much to lose. I didn't have much to lose whatsoever. I've been killed here, I would have been killed here, and I couldn't, I felt I can't survive without her. So I jumped over and I wound up in her, in, in the people that they selected. Of Thank you. This is tape four. 
Today is May 21st, 1996, and our survivor is Margie Berger. Would you like to continue telling us the um, story? I jumped over the divider because I couldn't care less whether I get killed right away because I couldn't manage without her being alone. And uh, it was mixed up. They were looking who was jumping over because not just me was jumping over, other people too, because we knew that we were going to go to the crematorium, the ones who, who didn't jump over. So it was a whole mix-up, and it was a whole tumult, and the Nazis started beating us terrible. And nobody, of course, wanted to say who jumped over and who what, you know. So this is the way I was saved the first time. Then we left in October, Auschwitz. We went through Mengele's uh, uh, selection. selection. At what point? At what point? In October. That, that point was that we are going to work. They were going to take us to a different camp. Who told you this? The block eldest. The, then she, we went over to a lager. From C lager, we went to a lager. I had typhus. I caught already typhus when I was in C lager. My lips were swollen tremendously. I was shaken like a leaf with high temperature. With high temperature, I was shaken and and I was skinny like 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 my tooth, well, like my um, thumb. I didn't know where to stay because the selection was, Mengele was sitting down and we were in a line. How did you know who he was? They told us. I heard from other people say. Maybe the Polish people pointed out to us or who, I don't know. We went through his selection. I didn't know where to stay. I asked Feige, I says, should I stay near you? She says, don't stay near me. Stay near somebody else because I don't know for what reason. I didn't know who to stay. Should I stay near a skinny, skinnier one than me? They'll say they take her to the crematorium, let her go too. If I would stay near a feather one, they will, they'll see how skinny I am. I didn't know where to stay, but I picked a girl from my hometown. Her name was Lily. She was a tall, beautiful girl at home. She had a gorgeous figure. And in concentration camp, she got very thin. She went into concentration camp with a beautiful, thin figure. Concentration camp, she became thinner yet. And I was standing behind her. And Mengele pointed. He didn't say nothing. He just this way, this way, this way, or this way. He was pointing left or right with his, with his finger. And he pointed to the left for Lily. And I was holding my clothes on the right hand side. So he told me to take the clothes to my left side. He wanted to see me. And I thought that he's telling me to go with her. I almost went after her. I'm telling you, I was just lucky, lucky, lucky. My mother probably wanted me to be alive. So I walked through. He pointed I should go to the right. I went to the right shaken like a leaf with very high temperature probably. I came into the A lager. Came into the A lager. I was burning up. I was just mamish burning up. My aunt Feige said maybe you should go into the there was a hospital. I don't know how it called. It was called something in German and I forgot. I can't think of it. Riviera? The Revere? Revere, yes, yes. She says, go in there, because I was shaken. 
I was burning up a temperature. She says, maybe they could help you. I says, Feige, I am not going no place. If I have to die, I want to die right here. I don't want to go no place because I know to the revere, if anybody went in there, nobody came out. As it turned out, as sick as I was, God helped me, and I made it out. There was a lunch lady, her name was Miriam Lebovich. She helped me, she was just wonderful. I am sorry that I didn't see her after the war. She died in Israel. She helped me, she brought me water. She brought me black coffee or what, whatever she was able to get a hold of. She brought it to me, I should drink it. And the next day, they put us on a transport to Ravensbrück. A lot of people got on with the typhus on the cattle cars to Ravensbrück. A lot of them who got on the cattle cars from Auschwitz to Ravensbrück never came off. We were laying on the dead we were stepping on the dead, we were sleeping on the dead in the cattle cars. There was no difference whether you were alive or you were dead. We weren't afraid, we weren't scared, nothing. It didn't mean anything. It didn't mean anything. It was, we were so cold already. We were so, a person, a life, our own lives didn't mean anything. We wished many times we should be dead. We should just have an easy death and just die because it didn't make a difference. At any point, did you ever question the existence of God? No, we, we were questioning how could God see us suffer so much. We were brought up, the only reason we suffered, we went through the, the camps and the Holocaust and all the terrible things for one reason, because we were Jews. Not that we killed people, not that we were bad people, we hurt people or whatever we did to other people. We didn't do it. The only thing we went through all those things because we were Jews. So uh, we didn't care. A person's life didn't mean anything. We were taking off from the from in Ravensbrück from the cattle cars. Half of us didn't make it. They died right in the cattle cars because one caught the typhus from the other one, and apparently uh, God wanted them in their own hands. And they didn't, uh, my, my, my sister's friend, who I knew very well, she never died in the cattle cars. We arrived to Ravensbrück, and we were under horrible circumstances. I had diarrhea, I had, I had, uh, uh, I was burning up the temperature still. I went to the to around around the uh, outside to to go to the bathroom to go behind the 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 behind the blocks, and a Nazi called me, and she gave me a beating, something terrible. She was taking my head from one to the left to the right, from the left to the right, and she was hitting me, and I didn't know. I was, as it was, I, 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 I probably lost consciousness. And this time I lost consciousness from the hitting so much. She says, we be stugevain. Where were you? Where were you? Tell me where you went. I says, I told her, I, I, have to, I had to go to the toilet. I have diarrhea, I had to go to the toilet. 
and she was constantly beating me. I think I have a loss of, of hearing in my, in my right ear from the constant beating, and I never took care of it just the last year that I went to a doctor to take care of it. Maybe if I would have done it sooner, my hearing would have been a little bit better. How did this camp compare to Auschwitz? It was a disaster. It was a disaster, the, 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 the camp. A lot of sick people came down. The Nazis were horrible. We were standing at Sail Appel, as I, as I told you. Uh, rain or shine or any time. And uh, in Ravensbrück, we were uh, about four weeks doing nothing. What was the food situation there? The same as in Auschwitz. And sanitation? Sanitation was worse than in, in Auschwitz. It was awful. It was a real death camp. A real death camp. Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a horrible place to be. What did you wear? The same clothing. How did you keep clean? Once in a while they took us to for showers in Birkenau in Auschwitz. But uh, in Ravensbrück I don't remember ever going to a shower or anything. The lies were we were picking the lice like somebody picks uh, crumbs from, from a piece of bread. It was awful. And uh, from Ravensbrück, after a few weeks, we went to um, Bendorf. Where was Bendorf, this? I think it was in Germany. In Bendorf, we were working five kilometers underground. How did you get there? With a lift, I think. A lift took us down, and it was all salt. While we were walking through the whole canal, it was all salt. Our feet, our bodies were swollen like turkeys. And we were working there in a munition factory. I was always with my aunt together. In Ravensbrück, from Ravensbrück to Bendorf, we were always together, me and Feige. What did you do in this factory? It was a munition factory. But was your specific job? I think they made uh, uh, bullets. I don't remember. I think it was bullets. So, uh, and we were working there for, from October till when was that? Um, October, November. Probably in December, in December, December, January, during the winter months. What was the weather like? It was bitter cold, bitter cold. How did in you keep Europe warm? Europe is much colder than here. How did you keep warm? In the snow, nothing, nothing. We went out, we were shivering, and we were standing sail appeal for a few hours, twice a day. What did you eat there? Oh, you know something? Probably the piece of bread with a little bit of, of, of hot soup. I really, I don't remember too well from then, that point on. How long were the hours that you had worked in this factory? The hours, a whole day. A whole day we were working there. A whole day. And we came home and we got a little bit of, of warm, warm soup without anything. 
and probably a piece of bread. And that was and that was it. And slept for a few hours and got up and went to work again. How long did you remain in this camp? I think we were there most of the winter. Most of the winter we were we were in, in, in Bendorf. When did you leave it? I left Bendorf. It was just before the uh, uh, before they freed us. It must have been March and April, May fifth. We were freed. It must have been about four weeks. May May fifth, April. Probably till beginning of April, we were in Bendor working. Uh, in April, they took us again in cattle cars, and they took us around from one place to the other ones because they didn't have where to take us anymore. The Americans were on one side, the Russians were on the other side, and we were in the middle. What were you told? Nothing. We were told nothing, and there was no food in those four weeks whatsoever. We were, they put us down on a big fields. I didn't see no houses, no nothing, only fields. There were gar garbage uh, uh, dumps. We went out and we ate garbage, whatever we found in the garbage. We ate grass, whatever we... Grass, mamish grass, just like any kettle or any, 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 any. We were eating that How many to people survive, were there? and we were asking for our death. We weren't afraid. Some people said they're going to line us up and they're going to shoot us. We said, thank God for that. We were praying for our death How because we couldn't take it anymore. How many people were you at that point? A few hundred. Who was supervising you? The Nazis. Do you remember the uniforms? Was it the black or was it the gray uniforms? I don't remember. These were men or women supervising? There were men and women. The women were worse than the men. The women were horrible. One particular one, I, 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 the one who beat me up in Ravensbrück was just horrible. She was a tall, husky woman. And she was awful, awful to everybody. The beatings that she gave for the, min for the minus thing, for anything. She just felt like, like, like hitting people and, and beating up people, and that's what she did. And then when we were there in, in, on that field, as I said, we were praying for our deaths. Our lives didn't mean a thing. We couldn't, we couldn't exist. People were falling left and right, left and right, in front of us, in back of us, in the side of us. People were falling. They couldn't, they couldn't take the hunger. It was mamish, not even that piece of bread that they used to give us in, in, in Auschwitz and in Ravensburg, we got that, that piece of bread. So uh, we were, we were there, and then it came Ralph Bernadot from the Red Cross. It's like I would see him now. What did he look like? What he looked, I wasn't so close, but I have seen the gatherings, the gatherings between the Nazis and him. And who else it was there, I don't know. But they said that Rav Benedot came with the Red Cross to free us. And then they took us and they marched, they walked with us. And there was a Nazi who was near me and my aunt. And she says, you are free people. You are going towards liberation. 
we couldn't believe it. We didn't believe him. He says, you are going to be free. It's no more concentration camp for you people. We broke out in joy and cries and laughter. It was something unforgettable. Unforgettable. And we really couldn't believe it. You know, it was such a coldness, too, because it was very hot, what we went through, what we lived through, that we're going to be free once. And this is the way it was. What was your physical condition at this point? I didn't know for myself anymore. I was very weak. I was weak, but I remember when Ravendor took us to Denmark. How we got to Denmark, I don't remember. But it, I think by trains. By trains, he took us to Denmark, and they watched our food. They says, we would love to give you more food. There is more food that's coming. But please try not to eat it, because you're going to get sick, and you could die from overeating, because our stomachs were shrunken. And, uh, and uh, uh, so they watched our food. They gave us sandwiches. I remember meat sandwiches. And it was an unbelievable thing, an unbelievable thing that we really have a sandwich in our, in our hands. And then from Denmark, they took us to Sweden by boat. We arrived to Sweden, and the Swedish people were as nice as it could be as nice as it could be. It was a beautiful, clean country. We arrived to Sweden and Landskrona. We were filthy. We were hungry. We looked like hell. Every one of us looked horrible. Horrible, only skin and bone. How long had you stayed in Denmark? Uh, not long. Not long, maybe a day or two. Maybe a day. And uh, they took us in, a Landskrona. They gave us beds, showers. They gave us change of clothing, underwear, which we never saw since at home. And they treated us royally. They were crying with us just like children because they have never seen people come out and look the way we did. I was very, was very thin. I took us to a sanatorium in Sweden because I was very undernourished and I was young. So they kept us there for a few weeks. Who were you with at that point? Pardon me? Who were you with? I was with Feige all along. I was with Feige. And they kept us there, they gave us selective foods, they watched us, they cleaned us. They were just magnificent, magnificent. And after that, from Landskrona, when they cleaned us up, they took us to uh, Reftele. to Reftele, and we were in Reftele for a few weeks. Then they, in Reftele, I asked who was in over charge of us. I says, I have a father, and I remember, is there such a city as Barranquilla? It was something stuck in my mind. 
You know, I was a child of 10 years old, and in Europe, a 10-year-old child didn't know as much as here from television, from radios, from schooling, from teaching, from different things. I didn't know all those things. So I went over to him, and I says, is there such a city as Barranquilla? So he says, I'll look it up on the map. And he looked it up, and he came, and he told me, yes. I says to Heidi, I says, there where my father is. And of course, uh, the press went out all over. And that, uh, you know, and they were announcing that this one is alive and this one, you know, the names and what. Oh, that came. Then they took us up in, in, in Sweden, our names, because till then we didn't have no name. We didn't have no name, uh, so my aunt didn't know whether I was a Gadalovich or an Isaacovich, so she named me Wake. And this is the way. It wasn't a strange name because my grandfather's name was Wake. Did you ever return to your hometown after the war? Yes. We took a cruise uh, in 1993. What was that like for you? It was mixed feelings. It was very mixed feelings. We took our two daughters, my husband and the two children, two daughters and my oldest granddaughter. And we went to our hometowns. My husband went to his hometown, I went to my hometown with the children. It was very strange. I didn't recognize the town whatsoever. They built it up, the Russians built it up tremendously. They made a city out of it. They um, they built all mostly one family homes, and they started building from the from the top down. The only thing that I recognized when I came into my hometown, there was a cross. Jesus Christ was there that they made before the war, and all the Gentiles who went past that uh, that cross, they used to always cross themselves. So that cross was still there, and this is the way I recognized myself, which direction to go, to my, to, to the house. And my aunts told me, when you come to Apsha, look up a Mihalka. That was the name of a Gentile who became very close to the Hungarians and who was instrumental that, to put us out from the house. because he was a little bit more intelligent like the other uh, 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 Gentiles. More intelligent than the other Gentiles, and he took over our business, and he took over our house. So when I came to Europe, I asked um, a Gentile there whether she knows where Mihalka lives, and she showed me where Mihalka lives, and we went over to him. I spoke a little bit, I'm speaking a little bit of Hungarian, and he spoke Hungarian because his home language is, uh, uh, his language is Romanian, but he learned by the Hungarians, uh, uh, Hungarian. And I spoke to him and I asked him, please show me where was our house. It was very moving, it was very touchy. Really, it was something terrible to see, but there was no sign of our house. They, they threw that house down, they threw down all the houses, and they built new houses. Did and you ever pointed, question him besides location? Did you ever ask him why he did what he did? No. No, I didn't, because the Romanians were quite rough. They were, we arrived with a car which they didn't see too many cars around in that neighborhood. We arrived with our children, with my granddaughter, and they started up with my granddaughter. And they're going to stop now.
This is tape five. Our survivor is Margie Berger, and today is May 21st, 1996. Where did you live after liberation? After you went from Denmark to Sweden, where did you go? We came straight to the United States, to New York, to Brooklyn. Were you ever able to um, find any surviving family members? No. No. Didn't, uh, I didn't find nobody because I knew and I saw my mother and my sisters went straight to the, constant, uh, to the ovens. And what about making contact with your father? I made contact. They, we were written up. The world has written up who survived from the concentration camps. My father got the word, the word that Mati Vake is alive in Sweden. He sent me a telegram if Mati Veik is his daughter. And if yes, he paid back the telegram and I should answer him back that I, whether I'm his daughter. I did answer him back. I got, I was overjoyed. My father was overjoyed that somebody from the family was alive and I was happy that I had a father and he had sent me plenty of money I had plenty of money in Sweden I wasn't I, I, I was able to buy anything I wanted I couldn't wait till I was re, re, uh, reunited with my father when did you finally get to see him? Um, I came to the United States in, nine, in April the 8th, 1946. I came to my uncle, Uncle Alex Gold, who lived on, in Williamsburg with my Aunt Shirley. They were two wonderful people to me and to Feige. Feige came along with, with me. We lived with them in a small four-room apartment. He made room. He told my aunt, my little girl is coming. That means his sister's little girl is coming. So my aunt thought it was a little girl. Then I came out from Sweden. In Sweden, they treated us so good, and I was so undernourished that I ate bread, I ate cake, I ate anything they, uh, 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 there was, was given to me. I didn't think of being on a diet to look thin, to look nice. I had food, I ate it. And I ate it and I came out, I was a size 18. And I arrived in the United States and I saw everybody was thin and I was still young. I was 18 years old and I was, I saw people live, people are not in concentration camps, people are out in the free world <clears throat> I wanted to be thin too, and I went on a crash diet, and I had lost weight. <clears throat> and I lived with my uncle and my aunt, and my aunt saw me when I came out of size 18. <clears throat> she said, this is your little girl? She looks like a big girl. So anyway, I came, and we were very, very happy and they were just marvelous people. They really made a home like not too many people who came out from concentration camp. They had what I had here. I didn't have to pay for room. I didn't have to pay for board. I didn't have to do anything. And he just couldn't do enough for us. We were, I was always writing to my father and he wrote to me and I wanted him to come out as soon as possible. But he had to wait for the quota from South America, and it wasn't so easy. Then I met my husband in Williamsburg by a cousin of mine. I fell in love. He was very good looking, and he was nice. And uh, what's his name? Walter Berger. When did you get married? We got married in November 30th, 1947. It's almost our 50th anniversary. And we have lovely two daughters. Their names? The daughters, the oldest one is Doris, and the younger one is Hedy. And they're wonderful children. 
They're pretty and they're nice and they're good. And they should only have muzzle. And uh, we got married in November. And I didn't want to get married. I wanted to wait for my father. My father wrote me, he says, if you find the right guy, he seems to be nice, so zamet Muslim at Brucha and get married. Don't wait for me because it could be a year, it could be ten years, and it could be two months. I don't know when I could come out. He says, get married. And I got married, and I was crying that I have never seen a bride cry. And she sits on the, on the bridal chair the way I was crying because it came back all my thoughts I have no mother I have no sisters um, I have a father and he's not here and whoever came up to congratulate me I couldn't even answer I was in constant cries I was constantly crying. How many people came to the wedding? Oh, we must have had about a um, hundred people. I think so. Who were they? It was all people from uh, during the war that we met. Uh, that we met in Sweden. That I met people in Sweden. Some of my landladies. Some of my friends from Europe. Uh, some relatives that my uncle. Uh, uh, had here and I didn't know um, landslide of my husband's side and my, and, my, and my side and my husband was first the waiter and then he became the bridegroom because he didn't have no money and he had to put together the, the little uh, call cuts and to, to prepare the tables in the synagogue on Stanhope Street in Brooklyn, and then he got dressed in the in the tuxedo or the suit or whatever he had on, like probably a suit, not a tuxedo, and uh, he was the bridegroom. When did you first resume an Orthodox lifestyle? After my children war I think in the third grade. Why was that? Life was very hard. I came out as a child, I didn't have no profession. I went to work in a factory and made little money. My husband was a busboy, a waiter, he made little money. We didn't have no money. We had to work we had to work all the time. And besides that, after a concentration camp, what we went through and we saw our sisters, our parents, our aunts and uncles and our cousins and everybody perished. I could talk for myself that I believed very little in God. I said, where was God and how could God be someplace and not see what we went through when they threw in our sisters and brothers in the, in the crematoriums. It was very, very difficult and I had a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Why? Why? Why innocent children? Why innocent people? Young people. My mother was 44 years of age. Why didn't she survive? Why did she have to die the way she did? And it was very, very difficult for me to accept any kind of religion. Till my children didn't grow up a little older and they started going to the yeshivas. That I woke up, this is no way of. I wasn't brought up, I was brought up religious. And, and it came back to me and things started getting a little better for us so that we started holding Shabbat and, and, and uh, 
is the way it was. How did you support yourselves later on? Later on when? After you worked in the factory and your husband was a busboy, what did you do later? I was working in supermarkets. Then I worked myself up and I, and I, and I, and I started working in Saks Fifth Avenue and uh, things were much better then already. I had more confidence in me. My English got better. I felt that I'm more I'm qualified for, for more than just to be a factory worker. I had a wonderful job. I was a very it was a very happy job for me. For me when I started working in Saks Fifth Avenue, thank God I didn't need the money. My husband made a nice living. But work for me it was something to get out from the house and do something, not to sit. And, 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 and run from store to store to shop and bring it back. This was no life for me. I felt that I'm more useful. I could do much more with my life than, than to sit home and, and, and do things, which I did anyway. My house was always clean and my house was always, there was always food in the house and I always cooked and I always baked. And things were just right because if you want to give something for a, give it to a busy person, that busy person is going to accomplish much more with their time than, than somebody who doesn't do anything. What are your Jewish affiliations now? My Jewish affiliations is I belong to the Hadassah. We belong to the synagogue. The name? To Linden Heights in Borough Park. We are very active. My husband is very active in the synagogue. He does an awful lot for Judaism and for, for Jewish organizations. And I try to do my very best too with everything in any place they need with me. And I try to be a good mother to my children, which I didn't have. I followed my children. My older daughter was in South America. Her husband was studying, went for medical, a medical school. I followed her to South America. I followed her to Pittsburgh. I followed her to Cincinnati. I followed her to Chicago. And I was always there for her every time she needed me. What do you think gave you the strength to survive? I wanted at least one, one from my family should survive and should be able to tell the world what horrible things the Jews went through for no other reason, only because they were Jews. When were you first able to discuss your experiences? I couldn't. Be, this is the first time that I've been talking to you. My children kept on bothering me all the time. Ma, talk about it. Tell us, where were you? What did you do? How was it? I couldn't talk because every time I talked, I choked up and I cried. I just couldn't do it. And I was very much afraid of today that I will not be able to, to talk and to accomplish a lot of things probably will come back to me and I'll think about it. I should have said it this way or that way, but it's too late. And, uh, but I tried my best to do and to remember things because I was young. When you think back, what one image comes to mind about the Holocaust? What did you ask me? What one image or thought comes to mind? What do you remember most? I'll tell you something. I could never forget, and as older as I am getting, the harder it is on me, and I remember more I wake up with terrible nightmares. 
I scream in my sleep. My husband has to wake me up a lots of times. And it's just too bad that I don't dream about my mother and my father and my sisters. I dream only about the Nazis, how they beat at me, how they shoved me, and how we didn't have no food, and how we were afraid that the next minute might go to the, to the crematoriums and I will not survive. And horrible, horrible dreams I have up to today, and I'm not a youngster. I'm 60 year, 68 years old, and those dreams and those thoughts just don't leave me. Sometimes people say, what is your hobby? My best hobby is to play cards, because when I play cards, all my, everything is forgotten. Everything is forgotten. I have to be occupied. I love people. I love to talk to people. That's why I took the job in Saks Fifth Avenue. I always met people, different people, and I spoke to different people. And it was just wonderful. I must have people. I must be surrounded with people. Without, without people, I am very sad and very depressed. Do you have any unusual fears or superstitions because of your experiences? Superstition is a thing that it was installed in me, probably from Europe, that I am a superstitious person. And thinking now, what are you most proud of in your life? Most proud is of my family, of my children. I have two wonderful children. One married a doctor. He's that doing thing, got very nice, and she's got three wonderful, beautiful children, smart, sweet, in every respect. She is very active in her community, in the schools of the children's schools, of the schools, of everything. Right now she's working in her husband's office. She has accomplished an awful lot, and I am very, very proud. And there, and Hedy married to a wonderful guy, Ben, Ben Lipschitz, he is just wonderful. He makes Tengat a nice living. They live happily. They have four beautiful children. All my grandchildren went to yeshivas and all have a very nice Hebrew background, a religious background, and they're wonderful and marvelous. And my daughter, Hedy, is a, is a um, social worker. She's got masters in psychology, and she's just wonderful, bright and smart and, 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 and good in every sense, and they're very active, as I said, in their schools and in their schools, and I'm very, very proud of them. What advice would you now give to your daughters and to your grandchildren and to the future generations that you might have? To my future generation, you could ask my grandchildren. That's what they'll always tell you whether I'm there or not. I says you could lose everything in life, but one thing you can't lose is education. And that's what I always tell them. Study and work hard and accomplish things. You'll feel good about it, and the world will feel good. And nobody, nobody, not even Hitler, was able to take away education from us. He was able to take away our sense of humor. He was take, taking away our uh, uh, belongings, our jewelry, our money, our everything. But education he was not able to take away from us. And that's what I always keep on telling my children. And we believe in education very, very much, me and my husband both. What message would you now like to deliver to the world? To 
the world, I would like to say one thing. I hope and pray that it should never, never, never be a Holocaust. It should never be for the Jews what it was, what we went through. It should be enough for our great, great, great grandchildren. It should never be, and we must work for a very strong Israel. And if you have a strong Israel, the world should know, my children should know, my grandchildren should know, that if we'll have a state of Israel, we will not have a Holocaust again. And we have to see to it, to have a strong Israel, because if we would have had Israel in 1944, we wouldn't have to gone through concentration camps. And this is my message to the world. Thank you on behalf of the Shoah Foundation. Thank you very much. Could you tell us about this picture? This picture is my mother, uh, Devora Alta, and she's holding Margie Berger, that's me, on her lap. I must have been about a few months or a year old on that picture. How old were you? Uh, must have been in... Uh, 1926, I was born in 27. Could you tell us about this picture? This picture was taken in Apsha, in front of our sukkah, and that was my sister, the taller one, the one who's standing up, the Her older name? one is Basku. She must have been about um, uh, 10 years old maybe eight, and my two twin sisters, one was Henchi, the darker one to the uh, left, and to the right was Laichu. She was a blonde little girl. How did you get this picture? How I got this picture? This picture I got from my aunt Haichu. She came from Europe. She was after the war in Europe, and she found the pictures at home. Uh, where she found them, I don't know. But she found them and she brought them to the United States and she gave them to me. Who's in this photograph? This picture is the front of our house. And in front of our house, it stays my aunt, Leia. And uh, you could see we rented out a store for the Batya. Batya was a, um, a store, a shoe store name called Batya, very famous uh, uh, company. Please tell us about this photograph. This photograph, I don't know where it was taken, but it looks like it's uh, in our backyard. And to the front, sitting down, was my mother, Devora, Devora Alta, holding me as a baby in her hands. To the left is my aunt Leia. After her, between Leia and my mother, is my aunt Peggy. To my right, in the back, stays is my aunt Shania. And to the the right, the last one to the right is my aunt Haichu, and there is my cousin standing next to, to the baby is my cousin Mati. Could you tell us about this? This picture was taken in Sweden, in Vernamo, uh, is my aunt uh, to the left is my aunt Feige, who I was together with her throughout the whole Holocaust. And the, to the right is me. What is her last name? Feige Vague. Who's in this picture? This picture is my lovely husband, who we got married in 1947. What's your husband's name? My husband's name is Walter, and uh, he was a very handsome bridegroom. And I love him up till today. 
Who's in this picture? This picture is my darling father, who it was taken in 1969 uh, before my daughter got married. And he was so proud of himself. He bought himself a beautiful tie, and he was proud, and he said, Merchen, when I'll marry off, when I'll marry off Hedy, he'll buy him a nicer tie. And he was, he loved the children, and he was very proud of them. And he lived with us, next door to us, for, for a lot of years before he took sick and before he died. And when did he first come to the United States? He came in 1947, in, um, December, in December 1947. Who's in the photo? In this picture is my aunt, <clears throat> Feige. Here she's called Fanny Hainish. I went through everything with her, and I love her dearly. This was in, uh, in, the, in our synagogue. We had a function in the synagogue, and there it was taken. Who's in this photo? And this photo is my lovely daughter, Doris. I love her very much. She, and that's her, next to her, to the right, is my daughter, Doris. Next to her, standing up in the back, is her husband, Jonathan. The last name? Jonathan Kanowich. And after uh, Jonathan standing up, to the left is Risa Kanowich, my oldest granddaughter. To the left, sitting down, is Erica Kanowich. Sitting in the middle is Nathaniel Lipschitz, my, my uh, grandson, Hedy's uh, uh, son. And to my, to my right is Naomi Kanowich. She's got three lovely daughters, my older daughter, Doris. Who is in this picture? To the left and right is my gorgeous daughter, Hedy, which I love her very much. In the middle, next to her, in the, in the back, is Meyer, Ali Melech, her son, my grandson which is gorgeous, and to the left is her husband, Ben Lipschitz, my son-in-law. Uh, to the left is my grandson, Nathaniel, wonderful boy. In the middle, with the blonde hair, is the little princess, Batsheva Lipschitz my granddaughter, my lovely granddaughter. And to the right is my little baby boy, Rafi. He's a sweetheart of a child. What is this daughter's last name? Lipschitz. Could you introduce your husband? This is my lovely husband, Walter Berger which we are married for 48 years, it's almost 49 years, and we had a wonderful life and wonderful children and wonderful grandchildren. And we gave them a wonderful education, and thank God we were out from, from, from a lot of trouble and a lot of hard luck. We came and we made it in the United States, and we are very, very happy. And we only hope that, that everything will be okay from now on, and for the Jews all over the world. Well, I, I thank you was, all for coming. I think that was very nicely said. I thank you. And uh, we, as you said, give the children that we weren't able to get, that's an education. And the same thing we are trying to do with our grandchildren. Thank you.